Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Politics with a Punch. Ringside. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff Cruer, and welcome to another edition of Ringside. We've got a jam-packed show for you tonight. We're going to be talking to all kinds of different guests. going to be talking about politics, talking about crime, and also talking about the Senate race that is coming up uh, in just a few months. But let's get started with some of the uh, top news stories we're following right here on Ringside. Folks, we've got a tight race now for president because we've seen a tightening of the polls. I mean, right after the uh, Democratic Convention, Hillary Clinton took a big lead. Then in recent weeks, it's starting to get close. And now the polls coming out this week show this thing is uh, getting very close. And I think uh, the debates are going to play a major, major role. Now, some of the big issues people have been talking about, of course, one of them is health. And what is the health of Hillary Clinton? Well, last week we had CNN uh, talk show host Dr. Drew Pinsky question the health of Hillary Clinton. And then lo and behold, a few days later, his show is canceled. Can you see a connection there? Of course I can. And of course, that's uh, a question that uh, the mainstream media doesn't want to ask. But a lot of people are asking it because Donald Trump has been very busy and active and Hillary Clinton has not. One thing we have seen this week from Donald Trump is a clarification of his position on immigration, a big speech on immigration, a visit to Mexico, certainly going to be a focus, I think, of his campaign, uh, doing something about an out-of-control uh, situation, a wide-open border. And I think that is what is certainly uh, one of the major planks of his platform. And finally, you know, kudos to all the volunteers, all the Good Samaritans, all the folks who got in their boats, went out to the uh, impacted areas of the Great Flood and helped their fellow Louisiana. And this is what was called the Cajun Navy. Now, one boneheaded politician, uh, State Senator Jason Perry of Baton Rouge, wants to regulate this group. These folks can't be regulated. These are volunteers. We can't fine them and uh, put fees on them for her permits on them. That's crazy. The best thing to do is get government out of the way. All right, when we come back, we're going to be talking to a gentleman about a group that is starting to get a lot of attention. It's called the Alt-Right. We'll find out all about it next right here on Ringside. I need help finding a doctor. Pace. I needed help with my medication. Pace. I needed help getting around. The Shirley Landry Benson Pace Center is a place that helps seniors remain in their homes providing the care they need. If you or a family member are over 55 years old, you may be eligible for benefits offered by Pace. For more information, contact us at 504-835-0006. Pace, caring for those who cared for us. Hey, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very pleased to have with us now a colleague of mine on WGSO. He hosts the Battle of New Orleans radio program. It's a Wednesday night, 7 to 9, and that's WGSO. And, of course, WGSO.com, 990 AM, and there's a tune-in app on your mobile device. And uh, it's good to talk to uh, our friend Nathan Lawrenson, who's now uh, with us here in person in studio. Nathan, how you doing? Man, I really appreciate the opportunity, Jeff. You know, before I heard you on the radio, I had watched your show in WLAE 15, 16 years ago, so it's, it's really great to be here today. I really appreciate the oh, opportunity. My pleasure, and uh, you know, you're really bringing a lot of listeners to your program on Wednesday nights, and uh, it's good to have you on, on this show. And Thank you. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a phenomenon that we've been hearing a lot of in the past few weeks, and that is a movement called the Alt-Right. Uh, Hillary mentioned it in her speech. Uh, a lot of the media has been demonizing the Alt-Right. Uh, you're sort of someone that uh, knows a lot about this topic. So let's, what is it? Yes, sir. I mean, you, you see the last few weeks this has gained traction, like, like you mentioned, with, since Hillary used it in her speech. I mean, the mainstream media and the mainstream establishment, they love to put people in a box, and they love to demonize, you know, certain groups of people. I mean, for me, it just seems like the alt-right is this populist dissident uprising who are very upset with the mainstream political parties on both the right and the left. Mm -hmm. 
I, I've heard uh, phrases like uh, national sovereignty, yeah. uh, also populism, but also white supremacy they've been throwing out there. Now, how, did that, how does that get mixed into it? Yeah, they, they certainly, and, and we see this a lot lately, you know, with the whole, you know, David Duke and Donald Trump phenomenon, mm -hmm. you know, the mainstream media tries to pin these two gentlemen together. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of see that with this whole white supremacist. Not, I'm not saying David Duke's a white supremacist by any means, or, or, but, you know, the media is trying to make this correlation right. that if you're um, pro-sovereignty, if you're pro-nationalist, that you must be a racist. Mm -hmm. And they try to um, tie in this whole movement with, you know, a uh, Hitlerian movement um, yeah. because, you know, they were pro-sovereignty and pro-nationalism. Well, isn't it a way to demonize and marginalize the movement? Isn't Ab that what's going on? Absolutely. It's just like using the term conspiracy theorist. You know, for, for people who throw that term around, that was a term that was created in 1967 to um, kind of marginalize the people who were questioning the JFK uh, story. Mm. So it's it's kind of the same thing, you know. If they call, and people are still questioning that today. Absolutely, I know you are. Yeah, right? absolutely. You need right. to question. We need to question everything, Jeff. And I think this is a big problem. You know, they everything they peddle and push at us. Mm. You know, the mainstream. It, it's usually a lie. So we should question. And if uh, by me questioning, you know, l uh, warrants a label as alt right or conspiracy theorist, then mm. I gladly wear these labels. Uh, the government uh, is uh, an entity that you don't trust very much at all, do you? No, sir. They haven't given me a reason to trust them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can go over and over with all of the lies. I mean, just throughout our history, I mean, and, and the government is tied in, Jeff, with the mainstream media. The establishment media and the establishment government because are the, one and the same. And there is, really isn't this whole two-party uh, duopoly. It's really a one-party system for the establishment, you know, and the globalists and the internationalists right. use both parties and they use all political systems to rule us. Uh, I've found a connection between the establishment and in, in the parties and uh, the mainstream media yes. and the government. I mean, uh, it's all sort of working together and then you have a guy like Donald Trump, who I think is a breath of fresh air, right. coming in from the outside, not part of this movement, and he is attacked and demonized, and he's linked to the alt-right as a way to make him seem to be a racist. I mean, that's, I think, one of their goals. Right, a absolutely. And now, you know, even with his campaign manager, Mr. Bannon, they're trying to say he's anti-Semitic and he's a racist and all this, even though Donald Trump um, has Jewish family members. Right, I know. But, but and he, Jewish business partners uh, and Jewish campaign officials. I mean, it's crazy. Absolutely. But you know what, Jeff? I think it's time... That people not be afraid to be called these names. You know what you are in your heart. And mm -hmm. if somebody says you're a racist because you don't like Obamacare, yeah. then you know what? Then so be it. Then mm -hmm. we must accept that. But aren't they losing the whole meaning of the term since it's bandied mm -hmm. around so often? Everybody's a racist. Everybody's constantly throwing that term around. I mean, what meaning does it have anymore? Yeah, it's it's losing its um, it's losing its value for sure. And mm -hmm. I think uh, I think we're real close to just decimating that whole narrative. Um, we've got about two minutes left, Nathan. The, the alt-right, how would you characterize that versus the Tea Party? Is this sort of the evolution of the Tea Party or a different uh, faction of the Tea Party, or is it totally separate? I mean, that's a great question, a um, very complex question. Um, you know, the Tea Party, it seems now, I believe, was very, very organic from its beginning. But now you see there's some global interests that kind of have infiltrated. I know... Um, the Koch brothers have spent a ton of money with the tea, you know, to try to uh, co-op the Tea Party. So I think, you know, the alt-right is more of an angry, upset, dissident, populist mob. Maybe not mob, maybe that's a bad, but just, you know, the, the citizens of this nation. Yeah. Grassroots. Gra absolutely, gra beautiful term, grassroots. All right, we've got about 30 seconds left. Where can our viewers get more information about your show and what you're doing? On WGSO, 9.90 a.m. every Wednesday from 7 to 9. Uh, it's hosted by myself, Nathan Lawrenson, and my co-host, Goyam. Uh, we, do, we do a great job. We, we try to uh, speak with whistleblowers inside the government, uh, former NSA technical director William Benny. We try to speak with CIA. We try to speak with FBI whistleblowers to try to give the real insight of what's going on because mm -hmm. 
The mainstream media are keeping us blind, and they're keeping us enslaved, and it's time we break these chains, and that's what we try to focus on on my show. Well, I appreciate you sharing some of your time with us, Nathan. Very uh, interesting, and uh, keep up the good work on the radio. Really uh, drawing a lot of attention to his show, Battle of New Orleans Radio, on WGSO 7 to 9 on Wednesday nights. All right, when we come back, another gentleman we've been working with on the radio and this program from the Home Defense Foundation, Mike Weinberger, will join us next right here on Ringside. Research Hospital is literally saving kids' lives. It's a very special place, friendly place. And to see the kids that they're helping on a daily basis was unbelievable. Families never receive a bill from St. Jude. Discoveries made at St. Jude are freely shared. The hardest cancer cases in the world go to St. Jude. We won't stop until no child dies from cancer. Join us. Join us. In supporting Hoops for St. Jude. Visit stjude.org slash hoops to find out how. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we're going to talk about a very important uh, topic now, and that's defense, home defense. Very pleased to have a gentleman who's the founder of, I think, one of the most popular and growing organizations in town, and that's the Home Defense Foundation. Mike Weinberger is joining us. And, uh, Mike, how are you doing? Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? Well, it's good to have you on the program, and uh, thanks so much for being here. For folks that don't know, and I know more people are learning every day, tell us what the Home Foundation is. The Home, home Defense, Defense Foundation. Foundation, Home Defense Foundation, hdfnola.org, there you go. <laughs> the Home Defense Foundation is an all-volunteer citizens group. We never ask for money. It's basically neighbors teaching neighbors, and you never have to pay for any of our classes. We have classes in self-defense, home defense, firearm safety, pepper spray, lighting. You come to a meeting, go to the website, learn about the meeting details. It's basically the first Tuesday of every month. And this coming Tuesday, we're having uh, Sheriff Newell Norman speak. So that's Tuesday, September 6th at Morning Call. Uh, morning, morning Call Coffee Shop in City yeah. Park, 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. So we meet over there and we schedule classes. And you can also go to the website to learn about classes. Well, let's uh, tell people a little bit about what the group's been doing. You haven't just been having meetings. You've been getting stuff done. And uh, we'll show a few pictures here. One is a group of uh, your members, activists, people that went up to Baton Rouge. And uh, there's sort of a celebratory picture outside the Capitol after... Uh, some success, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, who these folks are and what happened. Well, those were 10 volunteers that went to Baton Rouge to talk about a self-defense bill that was being considered by the state legislature. They were actually looking to modify your right, basically kill your right, to defend yourself with a firearm on any government-owned property that could be used for recreational purposes. Well, hell, even a street or a sidewalk could be used for recreational purposes, so you would not have been allowed to, harry, to carry a defensive firearm on any government-owned land that could be used for recreational purposes. Get this, even if you had a permit and went through the training and mm. were vetted by the state police wow. to get your permit, you still wouldn't have been allowed to carry, and those 10 volunteers beat that bill. We beat that bill. We got it defeated. And one thing I like about the Home Defense Foundation is that every meeting, Mike gets up there and recognizes the volunteers. And here's a, a picture of one guy who, who was a hard worker and, and got recognized. Calvin Tell Alexander was actually our spokesman that day in Baton Rouge. And you, you saw him in the other picture as well. And Calvin was making such a great case, and so are our other nine other volunteers there. On the spot, the state legislative uh, members of that committee on the spot, they basically killed the bill in our favor. On the spot. That shows you what a little pressure can do to these legislators. They're not used to, to hearing from a lot of their constituents. They're not. They're not. They're really not used to hearing from ordinary, middle-class, mm -hmm. honest... They're used type. to hearing from lobbyists. They're used to hearing from lobbyists, from what we call the suits. Yeah. The suits. <laughs> right. you know, but from ordinary people who go there in red T-shirts, you know, a bunch of red T-shirts from the 99-cent store, they're not used to that. And then that, that tells them that these people, these honest, tax-paying citizens, 
we mean business. Now, I want to show folks, when we started this, uh, we had like two or three people at a Panera Bread, uh, then we moved up to a Subway, and started getting some big crowds, and here was one of the uh, big speakers uh, I had a few months back, and that's uh, Kenneth Polite, uh, the U.S. Attorney, speaking to a nice, nice crowd. Yeah, that was a very, very good crowd. You're right, Jeff. When you and I started this, sometimes we'd have three or four people show up, five, ten people would be a big crowd. I remember I was so happy when we broke ten. Now we have 100, 150, sometimes 170, 180 people down to a meeting. We have firearm classes and self-defense classes every month. Sometimes 15, 20, 25 people attend a class. Mm -hmm. And we have three or four classes a month. Now the last big meeting uh, was held, I think it was the largest one we've ever had as far as attendance. And uh, this was our guest speaker, and this was another one of the people that received an award from the Home Defense Foundation. Of course, I'm talking about Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. Who's that guy standing yeah. next to him? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. Billy Nungesser, was, you know, he's a good guy, and he supports the right of self-defense. He supports the right for you to have a defensive firearm. So we recognize that. We try and recognize, you know, good men, mm -hmm. good women, and we gave him an award. A very prestigious award. We've yes. only given out six or seven in three and a half years. The Hero of Home Defense Award. Yeah, and well, I'm involved. sure it's in his office, I'll tell you. I'll I bet. I guarantee it is. I'll now, bet. the next project that the Home Defense Foundation is working on is something called the Honest Citizen Pledge. And, and Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about this? This is simply a moral statement, a pledge of morality that we're asking political mm -hmm. leaders to take. And uh, Colonel Rob Matus running for the U.S. Senate is already taking it. And what it basically says is that if you are an honest citizen, the mm -hmm. Honest Citizen Pledge, if you are an honest citizen and you're defending yourself at, with a firearm, a legally owned firearm, doing everything honestly and properly, and a criminal attacks you, you should get the benefit of the doubt. Why in the world are the politicians giving the benefit of the, of the doubt so often to the criminal? And often these mm -hmm. criminals attacking, they have long records. You know, they've been arrested, mm -hmm. as Billy Nungas was saying, not five or six times, Billy said, five or six dozen times. Right. So why are they getting the benefit of the doubt? And didn't we see this in action during the whole Merritt Landry case? Uh, uh, obviously. In the Marini? Yeah, I mean, there was a guy, a criminal. He was a teenager, but he was a criminal. He stole a gun a few months earlier. There was a warrant out for his arrest. He was trying to break into the Merritt Landry home mm -hmm. at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, he was shot, but, you know, he brought it upon himself. Right. And I always like to point as well to the Reverend Littleton case as a good example. Right. Reverend Littleton, a black fellow, he's defending, uh, someone is stealing stuff from his church. He's trying to stop them. He comes out with, with a firearm, tells them to stop. These two guys jump into a pickup truck and try and kill him, run him over. Well, he's firing his firearm. You know, naturally, the adrenaline's going right. 500 miles an hour. Right. The truck turns around. He, he's firing still. All this happens in the space of two seconds. He gets arrested afterwards because he was firing after the truck turned around. Mm -hmm. Well, who? In other words, I guess the theory was maybe they were trying to flee. Who's to say they wouldn't turn right. around again right. and try and run him over a second time? Exactly. He deserves the honest. Citizen deserves the benefit but, of the doubt. And we only doubt. have about 30 seconds, but instead he was charged. He was arrested, that's right, and he had to do a deal. Yeah. He had to cop and he wound deal. up uh, getting... He has to serve community service. Right. He should never have been arrested right. and prosecuted. I agree. I completely agree. All right. Well, again, we want to invite everybody to come out to the meeting on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, at the uh, morning call for uh, another great speaker, and that's Jefferson Parish Sheriff Newell Norman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank Appreciate you, Appreciate it very much. Thank you. And uh, keep up the great work, and we're going to see a lot of great things in the days ahead from the Home Defense Foundation, hdfnola.org. We come back. A candidate for the United States Senate joins us next right here on Ringside. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. We couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information.
Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're focusing on this uh, U.S. Senate race. Can have as many of the candidates as we can on over the next uh, few weeks. And we're very pleased to have a gentleman who was with us on the radio show recently. Charles Marsala is well known to our uh, viewers here on WLAE. He's got his own program here. And he's got a different uh, take on the race. He's running with some different issues, which I think maybe makes him stand out a little bit. Charles, how you doing? Doing great, Jeff. Doing great. Hey, thanks for being with us. Uh, for viewers that don't know you, haven't seen your show, very brief overview of who you are, why you're running. Sure. So uh, I'm from here. I went to St. Francis Xavier, then the Jesuit Tulane. Worked down in Homer for a while. I have a lot of family in Monroe. I went out to California to drill for oil and then stayed out there. I got a different job designing Air Force bases to repair parts of that. When I came back to New Orleans, I, I started my show because I loved Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom. And I traveled <laughs> a lot doing photography. For, I used I to love that show too. I mean, There's amazing yeah. stories. Mm -hmm. And people mm -hmm. always get a smile when you tell them that's what you bring yeah. you back. And as you know, I met the station manager, Ron Yeager, and I are friends from high school. Uh, we brought the show back, and it's, it's doing great. Mm. And then I've, I've been at the coast now, and I started looking at things and saying, my God, 30 years ago, I was studying some of these issues at, right. at Tulane Environmental Biology, and nothing's been done. And I, I've been mayor of a town out in California, so I decided to get back into politics. So coastal restoration obviously is a big issue, and uh, our, we're still losing, you know, Hundred yards every it, it, what it every hour? To I mean, about what? forty-five square miles a year. Okay, wow. Yeah. So, are any of the projects that have been started uh, doing any good? Yes, they are. And actually, I've been out in the field a lot and, and was doing this for my show. And then, so the deal is, is looking what works and what doesn't work, and trying to move more what works. Um, you know, they they just had a big deal that's been all over the media about forty-eight million dollars being given to an Indian tribe on Ile de Jean Charles to relocate. So I started looking at that a little bit, and then I went down to Jean Lafitte. We built a sediment pipeline that's 12 miles long that's diverting sediment to restore that, that marsh area. And there is, at Mardi Gras Pass, there's a, two years ago, mm -hmm. an opening appeared in the Mississippi River, and they're letting that to do, to see what it will do. But it's got some challenges when you just do it naturally because the fishermen there now have a bunch of fresh water coming into their saltwater fishing. So your campaign is really focusing on a lot of environmental issues. I want to bring back the Teddy Roosevelt type of Republican as a candidate. And, and what's great is Teddy came to Louisiana twice. Mm -hmm. I uh, went out to Mardi Gras Pass trying to get out to the island, and he walked on. He actually saved the snow egret mm -hmm. by declaring a wildlife refuge in St. Bernard Parish. And then he went out there to see how it was doing. And uh, many people know the teddy bear story where he refused to shoot a teddy bear, a bear. That was actually in Mississippi, just across the state line. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, he spent a lot of time in Louisiana hunting bear. And Tallulah, Louisiana is typically the place that celebrates that. So we know your environmental credentials and your interests. Uh, tell us about uh, other big issues in the race. So where do you stand on uh, tax cuts, dealing with the debt, uh, the problem we have with jobs in this country? If you could touch on some of those. There's, you know, those are big issues. And uh, I'll start with, well, I was surprised to hear, um, because the, it's a lot of, of detail, but uh, Ms. Fayard has advocated a big tax increase. And that's on inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. And it's done in a unique way. I'm now a financial advisor. And, I, and I've actually, I've written a book as I write a column on finance, a weekly column. And some of the parts of my book is called Leave Your Legacy. And then I hear her in, in one of the forums say how she's going to take your legacy away. And that really alarmed me. And the deal is, is if, um, if you bought Facebook at $20 a share and you held on to it till it was $100 a share, and then you leave it in your will to somebody, they get it at $100. It's called the step up. And that's, that saves a lot of people in taxes. Obama is actually looking at wanting to take that away. So then you have an $80 gain that would be taxed at 35%, and also take it to the next level, which could be the house. So with all the money that's been printed lately, we've all seen housing prices go up. So a house that was 100000 is now worth three. Right. You'd have a $200,000 gain on that house, 35% gone. You've got to come up with the money to pay your inheritance. You know, another issue I've been focusing on, Charles, is that as house prices have gone up, wages have been stagnant, uh, home ownership rate is going down. It, and we're at the lowest level in 51 years. It, it actually, you know, you think about his, his plan backfired. It hurt the people in the bottom end of the scale as opposed to helping them. They put in $4 trillion into the economy. Yeah. Home prices went up. So those that couldn't afford a home now have a higher price to pay because of so much money being dumped into the economy. What's your position on uh, Obamacare? You know, I, uh, one position I have, and I'm a Republican, is we should have been on it faster. Mm -hmm. uh, I was starting my own business at the time, and I, I played a lot of tennis. So I'd gone to see my, my doctor about a, my arm wasn't feeling good. 
the, that x-ray became a pre-existing condition, although he said you got nothing wrong. They wouldn't, I couldn't get insurance. And the pre-existing part, I think, has got benefits. The idea that you can also keep a child on there that's going to grad school mm -hmm. or the 25 years old to help them get started is also a benefit. There's some good there, but at the same time, it's clearly uh, the extra $20,000 that a small business has to pay a month or a year, whatever the size of the business, is crippling small business. And I know a lot of individuals are paying more for their premiums uh, as well, and, and they're hurting. And the of course, their, their wages aren't uh, going up. Exactly. And now I'm in that situation where my deductible went up right. and my premiums went up. And, it, and that, hence the Tea Party got started, because it's really right. a tax. Yes. No, way that, no matter how you slice and dice it, Obamacare is mm -hmm. a tax. All right, and we have only about a minute left, but what's your position on the, the threat of uh, radical Islam, ISIS? Uh, what should we be doing? Well, one of the things I also got involved in, and it's a side note, but it just to me shows how ineffective, when we're, I'm running against two incumbent congressmen. Uh, I had sent a bill to Congress two years ago that said, you know, there's eight countries in Africa that fund ISIS with, through ivory, rhino parts, and wild animal parts. So if we could pass a law trying to stop that wildlife trafficking, we could do a lot of good just doing that. And that ties into your environmental it, message. Back into the environmental message. Yes. And they, um, they refused to, to endorse it. It did get through the House. So one reason why I'm running as a senator, it's now S-27 in the House, in the Senate. It's been sitting there 18 months, and these two guys wouldn't endorse it in the House, so I know they're not going to take it in the Senate. Right. And what I hear is there's some Republicans who like to go hunt big game, and that might have been the reason why I didn't get that much right. Republican support. So I really want to get it through the Senate. I can't say I'm a supporter of big game hunting, so uh, I, I think maybe... It's, our mas it's the mascot of the party. I right. mean, like, give me a break. Right. Why would we not want to you know, preserve it? Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, so for our viewers out there that want to get more information about you, how can they do that? There's two ways. It's marsala for LA.com is the website. You can also text Marsala to 504 509-5500. I'm the only candidate running a text system right now. Wow. All right. Uh, cutting edge. Charles, thanks very much. <laughs> right, Good Jeff, luck to you. you. It's quite a race. 24 candidates. And uh, for uh, shows like us, it's fantastic because it gives <laughs> us a lot of time to talk politics, which, of course, is very important. All right. A lot more to get to. Hang on with us. We'll be right back. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for the final round, my commentary of the week. You know, it's been 274 days or so since the Democrat Party presidential nominee Hillary Clinton held a news conference. Now, this type of press stonewalling is unprecedented in a presidential uh, campaign with a major party nominee. We haven't seen it in modern political history. The American people have a right to know where these presidential candidates stand on the important issues and how they respond to all of these controversies. Hillary Clinton's opponent, Donald Trump, has held numerous and extensive news conferences in recent months. Hillary has employed the old hide-and-go-seek strategy with the press. She's refused to engage the national news media in an open and honest manner, and in the process shown tremendous disrespect for you, the American people. Now, the press should be outraged over such poor treatment, but they follow a different set of rules for Hillary Clinton. See, she's an exception as the first woman to be a major political party's presidential nominee. She also merits special treatment because she's a liberal. And then, of course, she's a politician with the last name of Clinton, a hollowed name among so-called American journalists. See, the old image of that journalist being that investigative reporter, that's a vestige of the past. The vast majority of today's quote-unquote journalists are merely liberal cheerleaders trying to cause problems for conservative candidates and help the Democratic Party in every way possible. So over the years, numerous surveys of journalists have confirmed the unmistakable liberal bias. This year, it's more blatant than ever. With the press as her staunchest advocate, Hillary Clinton has been free to ignore them. Donald Trump's on television almost every night answering questions from a wide variety of reporters and anchors. But Hillary's got this condescending attitude toward the press. Hey, it was on full display the other day. She delivered a big speech attacking Trump before a small crowd in Nevada. And then afterwards, the press came up to her, asked her some questions. Instead of offering some real answers, she offered them chocolates. <laughs> she said, here, try these chocolates. 
to the lapdog journalists who supposedly cover her activities. Now, the fact that she thought she could buy off reporters with chocolate candies is more than comical. It shows an utter lack of respect for today's political journalists. Her obvious stalling tactics have worked for nine months, during which time her campaign has been rocked by multiple scandals. We've got Benghazi, we've got email, we've got foundation, we've got corruption, we've got all kind of her health, all kinds of things. Many raging controversies, many brewing scandals that one day, finally, maybe the press will get her to address. Let's hope so. All right, folks, if you've got a question or comment you'd like to share with us here at Ringside, please email me at jeff at ringsidepolitics.com. Hey, follow us on Facebook also, facebook.com slash ringsidepolitics. That's it for tonight's show. I'm Jeff Cruer, and keep in mind here at Ringside, we don't pull any punches.